Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Edward Schmidt. He's president of the Board of the Alaska Wildlife Alliance and chairman of the Board of the Kenai Area Fishermen's Coalition. He's a retired surgeon and rancher. He lives in Soldotna, Alaska, along the Kenai River. So first, uh, thank you for your work, and second, thank you for being on the program. Oh, you're sure welcome. Thank you for having me. So in the sort of pre, pre-talk pre before we did the actual interview, um, we were going to talk about the Ambler Road in in that's that's proposed in the Southern Brooks Range, I believe. Um, but then in the pre-talk, we, we realized that there are a lot more issues in Alaska that people in the lower 48 don't know about. So would you mind talking just briefly about the Ambler Road and then talk about some of the other uh, important issues that are going on in Alaska that um, that a lot of us down here in the lower 48 never hear about. Yes, I'd be happy to. And I can start with the Ambler Road project. Um, it's interesting, most of us in Alaska haven't been to the Ambler area. Um, I believe it was one of the last places in the country that was open to homesteading. And so people who live there were able to homestead relatively recently and prove up their claim and, and get their land. So it has that flavor of it still is probably the very last frontier where people moved because they appreciated the rivers and the wildness of the area. Um, the Ambler Road is a proposed 211-mile road. And you can say 211 miles, but imagine how long that is through untouched, an untouched landscape. Um, it would go from the Dalton Highway, um, which is where the Trans-Alaska Pipeline runs up to Prudhoe Bay, and it would cross through the gates of the Arctic National Park, the Noatek National Preserve, um, the gates of the Arctic National Preserve, and encroach on national wildlife refuges. Um, in its plan, it would, or in its proposed plan, it would cross over 3,000 streams and 11 major rivers and 1,700 acres of wetlands. Um, again, having lived my earlier life in the lower 48, I just would ask people to imagine, take 211 miles somewhere where you live, crossing that many water bodies and, and parks, and think of what an impact that would be to your state to have that area suddenly opened up. And the reason that they would like to do this is to have a Canadian company build a mine, and it would the road would allow the mining products to get to market. Um, a lot of us feel like that is an absurd trade-off. Um, we don't have that much wild, undeveloped land left. And to do a project of this magnitude just seems absurd. And then I can't even begin to envision what it would cost. The state of Alaska has been going broke the last couple of years, we have very, very little income. We are looking at hopefully big oil will come back and we can tax them to death and live in an economy where we can spend as much as we want because we can tax the oil companies. Um, over the last couple of years, that does not seem to be the case, yet people still think, oh, if only we can get some big company in, we'll tax them. And one of the ironies is we don't even tax mining all that much here. We tax the oil production, but not the mining. So, again, imagine this enormously long road through unspoiled areas to at, at a cost that could be – the money could be put to so many better uses. Um, it just seems absurd, and yet – that's what the current administration seems to want to have to happen. So, 
that doesn't seem to be the only major sort of boondoggle road that is being and destructive road that's being pushed in. Um, are there any other roads that you would like to talk about? Yes, our Alaska congressional delegation and our state government seem to think that any job is far more valuable than preserving any amount of wilderness. And although Alaska is vast, most of it isn't particularly productive. Parts that are productive have been set aside by the federal government for things such as national wildlife refuges. Um, the Eisenbeck National Wildlife Refuge is home to countless migratory bird species, and they use that area for nesting. That's why the Eisenbeck Refuge is set aside. There is a small village of Cold Bay that would like to be able to get the fish they catch to market, and so they want to build a road from Cold Bay to King Cove, and the environmentalists or anybody cared with the fate or caring about the fate of migratory birds, has said that's a terrible trade-off. A road that would only be passable during the summer to get fish to market through one of the last good nesting areas for migratory species is not a very good trade. Unfortunately, within the last month, Secretary Zenke has just signed the paperwork to, in essence, destroy a good aspect of the National Wildlife Refuge and build a road through migratory bird nesting habitat, solely so a village can get fish to market during the summer. They claim that it's for safety, that the people of Cold Bay, if they have a medical emergency, would need this road to get to the hospital. But all the studies show that it would be almost impossible to keep it open during the winter because of the severe weather, that even if you had a fleet of snowplows, you couldn't keep the road open. Senator Stevens had gotten them a multi-million dollar hovercraft to go across the bay. The conditions are so bad that frequently that thing can't even work. And to say that we care so much about the few residents of Cold Bay, if the government here would spend anywhere near that much money per capita on my health care, that would be just amazing. But it's a totally disingenuous way to talk about a road through a national wildlife refuge that will significantly impact migratory bird nesting, and the results will be sort of invisible. Most people won't really be aware that there aren't quite as many migratory birds as there used to be. And even if they would kill thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, nobody would really be aware that this road would give an economic boom to a, a, a small handful of people. And yet that's the decision our Department of Interior has just made against the objections of all the wildlife managers and anybody with any common sense about what's important up here in Alaska. It's just shocking to me. Um, let's back up a second. And, um, you know, I live just north of the Klamath River in California. And back in the 1930s, there were, um, even, even as late as the 1930s, there were accounts of the entire Klamath being, quote, black and roiling with salmon. And several years ago, uh, maybe tw 10, 12 years ago, somebody from Alaska sent me a picture. I write about salmon a lot. Somebody from Alaska sent me a picture of a river in Alaska that was, um, it looked like just a regular river. It had a little bit of, of gold on each side, and then the whole rest of the bottom of the river was black. But then if you look more closely... You can see that's because the bottom is, is sort of golden, but there are so many salmon that you can't see the bottom of the river. And what I've read about Alaska is that there are still places there that are as wild and fecund and full of life as was true for this whole continent. 
Um, so can you talk just a little bit about uh, the wildlife in either your part of Alaska or, um, I mean, how are the, how are the fish there? How are the bears there? Or one more thing is that I get really excited because where I live, I see a black bear, a, usually a mother and cub almost every day during the spring and summer. But I've read accounts of California prior to conquest. You would see a, if you were near a mm-hmm. river, you would see a grizzly bear every 15 minutes. And that's very, very often are you see accounts like that. So can you talk about a little bit about what it's like there, the the grizzly bears or wolves or, I mean, I've never in my life heard a wolf. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the wild that, that is, the, you know, we, we talk about this road and we talk about, we talk about these two roads, but what is being, what is at risk? That's my question. Sorry to go on so long. No, and, and that, that touches on many, many aspects and the answer will be long. Um, I live on the Kenai River. When I first came to the Kenai River, I accidentally ended up staying in the bed and breakfast of the park superintendent, or at least the former park superintendent. He had incorporated much of the Kenai River into the Alaska State Parks. And he said that I ought to go fishing with him to see what the river looked like. The salmon come in on the high tide, um, and I'd grown up in Colorado where I fished mountain streams all my life and thought some of those were pretty impressive. On the high tide of the Kenai River that, I guess it was in August, when the tide comes up something like 12 miles up the river, the tides here can be 24 feet tall or high regularly, the salmon come in as the tide pushes all that seawater up the river. And so I watched the river go from a flowing river to sort of a tidewater lake. And on every square foot of that lake, there was a salmon back porpoising up the river. The fish finder was just black with fish under the boat that we were sitting in. And it was amazing to me how many fish came in on this particular high tide. The Kenai River still gets that to some extent. At that time, though, we had the biggest king salmon in the world. Um, it was very common for 70 and 80 pounders to be caught. I think the world record is a 93 pounder that was caught in the 70s. I have watched those salmon essentially disappear, the the big kings. Now we get a run, and if they make numbers of 5,000 in the early run and 25,000 in the later run, our Department of Fish and Game is very, very happy. When I first got here, people caught that many fish. It wasn't just what the escapement should have been. Um. When you see a river and what they can produce if they are managed well versus what you see on the Klamath and what I've seen over the last 30 years on the Kenai River, um, it's heartbreaking. The Kenai River is still very productive. We get a very, very good red salmon run, but it breaks my heart that the world record king run has been decimated solely because people can't resist killing a few more than they need to. Um, I'm not against people catching, eating fish. I love to do that. I mean, that's why I'm here. But we should only take the excess or the surplus, not try to justify how many can we kill each year. And then over the course of my lifetime, watch a worldwide treasure become something very mediocre and some years we get such a poor king salmon run that I'm very afraid that the big ones will never ever come back. And it's the kind of thing that that it's not every female salmon makes a, a certain amount of babies. Fish are unique in that the bigger they are, 
they exponentially increase the number of babies they can have. So a king salmon female, it's roughly 17 eggs per millimeter. Every millimeter more she grows, she produces 17 more eggs. So the much bigger ones are far more productive than ones half their size. Um, I've still seen that. I used to have grizzly bears come through my yard on their way to the river as they would catch the fish. Um, a lot of people up here are just terrified of the bears and would rather just shoot every single one of them. A lot of people think it's just an amazing sight to see a grizzly bear fishing by the river. Um, fortunately, in some of the places I still go to fish, I can see that every so often. But the Alaska Department of Game has recently wanted to try to exterminate bears and wolves from the Kenai Peninsula to try to increase the number of moose. Um, so we have taken three to four times the number that are sustainable, and the number of brown bears that I see has really, really diminished. And it's very pointless. It's, it's They say they want to have trophy hunting. Well, how many people are really impressed by a great big brown bear? And with the numbers they're taking, most of the bears are just relatively small ones. They aren't even all that impressive for trophies. Um, and it's just a, an absolute waste of a natural resource. Um, most of us that have moved here to Alaska, and that is roughly 78% of the population, moved up here because we still get shivers down our spines when we see rivers full of salmon, when we see the iconic wildlife, the moose, the bears, the wolves. And it's heartbreaking that, that the administration seems to want to turn this into strip malls interspersed with gravel pits, not even aware of what treasures were destroying by death of a thousand cuts. Um, the Kenai National Wildlife Refuge, which is literally in my backyard, used to be the Kenai National Moose Range. And in the late 1800s, the hills were white with sheep, with the doll sheep that people would hunt. Hunters would come from all over the country, and instead of shooting one moose, they'd fill canoes or boats with eight or ten big moose. It was one of the first places where Alaskans tried to instill some order and insisted that the federal government hire game wardens. People said, we can't keep taking at this rate. Um, it was one of the first, again, national wildlife refuges that FDR signed into existence. But by then, the market hunting for building the railroad from Seward up to Anchorage uh, the population increase, the many, many, many years of no limits um, have left it a, a mere shadow of what it is. The Caribou Hills are called the Caribou Hills. Very few of us see any caribou up in those hills. Um, one of our great hikes is called Slaughter Gulch. Nobody can remember whether it was the sheep or the goats or the moose that they slaughtered all of them to give Slaughter Gulch its name, but there's hardly any wildlife in Slaughter Gulch anymore. Um, it takes many, many, many people a lot of effort to preserve the animals, to preserve the fish, so that everybody can see it. A very few can slaughter them all. And that's what is so distressing. This really is the last place in the world, I think, where we've done as much to manage and try to preserve the salmon runs, the moose populations, the bears, the wolves. Um, 
and the wildlife refuges are mandated to preserve the natural ecosystems for biodiversity. One of the very first things the Trump administration did was abolish rules that over two years our wildlife refuge put into place. Rules that say you cannot shoot wolves and bears out of helicopters. You cannot go and gas them in their dens to kill them. For some reason, our Alaska senators and congressmen take horrible exception to those rules, thinking that we cannot exist as a state unless we're allowed to gas wolves in their den and shoot bears and wolves from helicopters and bait in brown bears to shoot them. That is just an absurd way of thinking. But that destruction has already occurred. Um, it's, it's very, very frustrating to me. So are there... Um before we go on with some other destructive projects, um, you've talked about like the fecundity of the fish, but you've also mentioned in passing the um, the migratory uh, songbird, or I'm sorry, not migratory songbirds, but the migratory birds. And can you talk a little bit more about which birds those are and the, the numbers that you see. And I'll give one example from this that, that, I mean, as always with environmental issues, they, they break our hearts. But when I was born in Nebraska, I also grew up in Colorado, by the way. Um, I was born in Nebraska, and when my mom would take me back to visit uh, her mother in Lincoln, uh, we would often in the spring stop by the Platte River, and she would we would see the migratory birds and then she would tell me stories of when she was a child that there would sometimes be so many birds that they would be like at Chicago's O'Hare airport that the flock would be circling up above until another flock would take off because there's no more room on the river. There's more birds than the, than the Platte river could hold. And that's not, I mean, the numbers of birds have just, have just plummeted since then. Of course the Platte river has also been quite dried since then too. So can you can you talk a little bit about about who these birds are and the the numbers that that you see and that might have been there before? Um, I am not an extensive expert on birds. I love to watch the birds. My favorite birds are the Arctic terns. Um, I don't know how many of those you've seen, but they come up to Alaska every spring to nest and have their babies. I think they're afraid of the dark because as soon as it starts, the days start to get short, they migrate and they go clear to the southern poles. So they spend their time between the northern pole and the southern poles. That flight is it, it, just unbelievable to me. They are the most elegant flyers I see. Um, when I'm fishing, I can watch them take insects off the water. They can dive down and catch the lamprey eels and other things under the water. They're just very, very elegant birds. If someone down in South America were to decide that they needed to do some project, they could kill them all. And then one year, they'd just never show back up here. I'm not sure how many people would ever even notice, but I really would. Um, in the springs, the varied thrushes, they're, they're a, a beautiful bird. There's something that I just love to see because I hardly ever get to see them, but you hear them all the time. Their calls are very distinctive. It's like a telephone ringing. So as I'm walking through the woods to go to the river fishing, I can all of a sudden hear in early April the varied thrush return, the ruby-crowned kinglets, the, um, oh man, I can't think of other examples, but as April progresses, all the migratory birds start to come back and they are going to nest up here before they head back down um, south. 
at our birding club this week, a fellow gave a presentation of the Cook Islands, which is roughly 20 degrees south of the equator. And three of the birds he saw there all nest in Alaska. And those birds were born in Alaska, but go to the Cook Islands for their summers. Um, our national wildlife refuges were formed as FDR recognized. We were destroying these migratory species because if one place on their journey becomes inhospitable, they, they don't get do-overs. They, they, that will kill them all. And so it is a tribute to our wildlife refuges that we have as many migratory birds as we do. And you can get lulled into a sense of security. If you see a gigantic flock of this or that, think, oh, man, there are millions or thousands of these around. They'll always be here. And the point is that's not true. It's a lot of work by a lot of people to make certain that they're protected where they're most vulnerable and that we don't just kill them for plumes for hats or something like we used to do down in the Everglades, that, that we say, these are valuable beyond what we can kill them for right now. And maybe if there is a true surplus, we can eat some ducks and geese. Again, I'm not against that at all. It's just this very short-sighted, what can I kill now or take now without any consequence of what does that mean for the future? Um, yeah, the, the Platte is an amazing river. I, when I was a kid, seeing the ducks and geese along that. It was just fascinating to me. And I think maybe that there are some people that are not moved by that. My sense is most people really are. And that the few that aren't take so much from those that are that it, it brings all these issues into, into focus. So a handful of people might make a lot of money on a road or a dam or a mine, but everybody else loses. At what point do we say we've learned from our past mistakes? And again, Alaska is the last place on earth where we can make that choice. We don't have to destroy all the fertile places in Alaska just because we can. So I don't, I don't know if you'll have an answer to this, but it's, you know, we have all heard of, uh, Keystone XL and we've heard about major projects happening in the States. And in no way am I, uh, demeaning the efforts to stop those, which are incredibly important. But this conversation started with a, 211 mile road that I'm guessing 99.9% .9 of the people in the lower 48 have never heard of. And then there was the second road that you mentioned that I'd never heard of. And, you know, I've been working on these issues for decades and I haven't heard of either of these roads until recently. And is, is, is there, um, is that just my ignorance or, or do you think there, or why do you think that, that, do you think it's true that a lot of people in the lower 48 may not hear about some of the projects in Alaska? And if that's true, why do you think that's the case? Um, I'm going to say something that I hope my friends in the environmental community won't take great umbrage with, but I think every environmentalist has heard of the Keystone XL pipeline. My view of that is that our efforts would be far better placed talking about something that makes a whole lot more sense. We have countless pipelines that get oil and fossil fuels to market. And I can appreciate the idea that well, we don't want more fossil fuels to market, but the reality is our lives are all dependent on these fossil fuels. We don't want oil spills. We don't want contamination of groundwater. 
we don't want needless disruption. But I think focusing on an issue like the Keystone XL pipeline and missing the Pebble Mine, the Chuitna Mine, the Ambler Road, the Eisenbeck Roads, the very evidently destructive projects that are being proposed up here in Alaska, the assault on the national parks and the national wildlife refuges by the state fish and game to say, we want these to be managed for game parks. We want to shoot more moose and caribou, even though there are so many people, nobody could shoot a moose or everybody in the state couldn't shoot a moose and live off it like maybe 50 years ago they could. There just aren't the numbers in Alaska. It's not that productive. I get frustrated with our national environmental efforts that I don't think focus on the proper things. Um, I think if people came to Alaska and saw the fish and the wildlife and our scenery and said, maybe our biggest priority as environmentalists would be to save this to make sure that my grandson will be able to grow up and see what I saw might make more of a sense or, or might make more sense. And so I don't want to poo poo what the environmentalists are focusing on. But when I see what's happening in my backyard and how easily preventable it would be if more people said, Let's not kill the last grizzly bear on the Kenai Peninsula. Our State Department of Game just passed a proposal to eradicate all the wolves on the lower third of the Kenai Peninsula around Kachemak Bay and Homer. I would think that the environmental cause would be served much better by some umbrage at that proposal do you really think Alaska would be better off without bears and wolves? Um, it, it's those kind of things that that I get a little bit frustrated with. Um, and I don't know what the best solution is other than the awareness that this still does exist. It's not like down in the lower 48 where everybody hears about how it used to be we still get to see it. But unless we're really, really vigilant, that's going to disappear. How many more roads do you need to build through these critical habitats before it dawns on us that, gee, there used to be a lot of birds. There aren't that many anymore. I mean, even looking at all the Audubon bird counts, the numbers are declining. And that should be something that the environmentalists rally around. Um, rather than pick, you know, a few grandiose schemes that I don't think we can stop anyhow, we might be far better off to say, let's waste less fossil fuel. Let's burn less fossil fuel. Let's have our buildings be far more energy efficient. Um, let, let's seriously consider whether we need to drive where we need to drive or whether it might be more fun and more exercise to take a bike or take a hike. Um, I think there are many more decisions that we could make if we looked at what can I personally do about these things that bother me rather than shouting about what should somebody else do. So you, I don't know if that makes you, any. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, that's right. You you mentioned you mentioned the 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 pebble mine, which I've heard about quite a lot actually, and then you mentioned another mine I haven't heard of. Can you can you talk about those two mines for people, please? Just briefly. yes, the Twit the Twitna mine was a coal mine. Um, it's on the other side of Cook Inlet, the Kenai Peninsula, where I live. We are on the east side of the Cook Inlet. On the west side is relatively undeveloped because there are no roads to it. Well, the Chutna River is a salmon 
Bering River near the town of Tionic. It's a native town. And an outfit out of Dallas figured that a couple of miles up that river was some really good coal grounds. So they proposed a open pit coal mine through the river that would completely disrupt the salmon run. They'd have to build a, a loading dock roughly a mile out into the Cook Inlet, which is one of the most prolific inlets in the world for saltwater fish, to load the coal to sell to China. And again, our Alaska representatives thought this would be a great idea if somebody from Dallas, Texas, might make a fortune selling coal to the Chinese, despite mining through salmon streams, building docks into the Cook Inlet, and they touted it, there might be a few jobs for a few Alaskans. Um, it turns out the project is completely uneconomical as the world is turning away from coal to much cleaner and much cheaper natural gas. But we were not able to get the state of Alaska to say that the salmon deserved a water right, that keeping water in the rivers for salmon should be a priority, and that if any other project is contemplated, one thing it cannot do is dewater a river that has active salmon runs. Almost everyone in Alaska feels that we should do all that we can to keep our salmon runs intact. No matter what your political views on very many things, that is a universal feeling of most Alaskan citizens. The idea that the State Department of Natural Resources would not allow the citizens to claim a water right for the salmon and would not allow the salmon to claim a water right is just absurd. So we have a ballot initiative up in Alaska to say salmon deserve the right to swim up the rivers and spawn. And it's amazing the industry groups that are fighting that. So that is an example of an absurd project that would have benefited somebody from Dallas, Texas, maybe, at a tremendous cost to the local Alaskans that probably doesn't make any economic sense whatsoever. The other one, the pebble mine, is actually still active, as the Trump administration told the EPA. They aren't allowed to say that an open pit gold mine with cyanide leaching might pose a damage to the tributaries of Bristol Bay, which is currently the world's biggest salmon production fishery. Um, on the face of it, leaching cyanide into Bristol Bay with a giant gold mine does not seem to be a very good trade-off for most Alaskans. Um, to potentially devastate the world's most productive fishery so a Canadian company with a terrible track record for mine safety could build a mine in the heart of the Bristol Bay headwaters? Um, again, it's one of those value questions. What do we gain and what do we lose? And anybody that looks at that reasonably would say it's far too risky to the world's most productive salmon runs. Um, we have been fighting that since its inception. And it's the kind of thing we can fight for years and years and years. But like the Eisenbeck Road, the Secretary Zenke can turn away years of effort overnight with one stroke of a pen without any real concept of what he's doing except develop and build jobs, which would probably actually take away from development and jobs as it would put all the commercial fishermen out of business. It's hard for me to encompass the vastness of these issues, but I don't think any rational person in the lower 48 
who actually owns that land because uh, of the national parks, of the national wildlife refuges, of the national forests, of the national, the United States ownership of Alaska for the benefit of all the United States citizens, to have those things taken away for the benefit of a very few who might make a whole lot of money just seems absurd. And I wish environmentalists would focus more on those kind of issues because they are things that, that we could make a big effect on if we were more aware. Well, it, it, it seems to me that one of the most important things that any of us can do is to protect every wild place and every wild community possible. Um, it's, it's like my friend John Osborne, who, who really got me into environmentalism decades ago, um, always says that as things become increasingly chaotic, he wants to make sure that some doors remain open. And what he means by that is if bull trout are around in 20 years, they may be around in 100, but if they're gone in 20, they're gone forever. And exactly. so he sort of takes a not on my watch attitude that as long as he is alive, um, you know, the Selkirk caribou, are he will fight for them and it seems to me that that's in the face of these constant onslaughts because you know you have these stories here which are incredibly important mm -hmm. and if we just transpose this anywhere else in the world yeah we have a degraded landscape but there are people in florida who are fighting you know similar battles against similar mines it's just that it's a degraded landscape and and it just seems so desperately important to me that that we that we that we fight for every 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 migratory bird nesting or stopping place and every 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 salmon refuge. I'm so say whatever you want about that. I'm done. Yes, um, when I told you in the, my bio that I was a rancher. Um, I was dedicated to holistic resource management, meaning how does all this work together? And the bottom line was if I grew more grass, I had more cattle. And if the cattle were more healthy, by rotating them through the grasslands, I could have more, even more grass and have even more cattle and even more living things. And there was a fellow that plays Thomas Jefferson, and he quoted that somebody who grows two blades of grass where one grew previously has done more than all the statesmen who've ever lived. And that was sort of my philosophy on my, my ranch. The more grass I had, the healthier it was. The more dung beetles I had eating the cow droppings, the better I was. The more babies of anything I saw in the spring, the healthier my landscape was, and the better off I was, the richer I was. And that actually translated because the more cattle I had, the richer I was. I got so, if I saw more baby rattlesnakes that spring, I was really happy. Things were working because stuff was growing that I hadn't seen growing there before. And if, if I could have more people aware of that sense that if we see more babies of any birds, of your deer, your elk, your antelope, your foxes, your bears, your wolves, if each spring brings more rather than less, we are far better off. Um, the more vegetation, trees, wildlife, flowers we see, it's a very rare person that isn't happier with that. Um, very few people can look at the vistas that I have in my backyard where I can go skiing each afternoon and look out over the wildlife refuge and see the sunset and see the moose and see the wide open ranges. I get shivers down my spine and I think how lucky I am to live here. But the point is, 
our managers at the Kenai National Wildlife Refuge are working very hard to keep that. Somebody could ruin that in my lifetime. Like your friend, I feel like it's my obligation. I want my kids and my grandkids to see those sort of riches that have made me immeasurably more wealthy during my life. Um, again, if a true environmentalist focused on that, we humans can fit in with the world. We don't have to conquer it. We don't have to turn it into a concrete jungle with only the plants we want to live with pink flamingos in the yard. We can appreciate just the miracle of all the natural stuff around us. Um, I find that a lot more rewarding. And that's why I moved up to Alaska to retire. I want to spend the rest of my life enjoying this. It seems to me that the most important question a person can ask is, is, is the world a better place because you were born? And is the world a better place because you lived here? By which I mean exactly what you're saying. Are there more, um, varied thrushes? Are there more rattlesnakes? Are there more, um, daddy long legs? Are there more banana slugs? Are there more king salmon? And it seems to me that's the, that's the most important question. And we have like two or three minutes left and, is there anything you want, I mean, what you've said is great, and is there anything that you want to leave listeners with, either about these projects in Alaska, or about um, what people should do in addition to what you've said? Um, I think you nailed it. Every day I can get up and say, can I make the world a better place for everyone, or can I be greedy and take far more than I should or need and maybe make it better for me, but then I'll turn around later and think, boy, I really didn't make it better. I made it even worse for myself. If people would look at it that way, I think we'd all get closer to what it is that we want. And I feel very lonely up here in Alaska fighting for what I think I'm fighting for everybody in the entire world to give them the chance to see what can be if we just don't screw it up. Um, I think people can support our heroes, our park service people, our wildlife people, anybody working toward conservation um, are the true heroes of the day. And I just appreciate a chance to discuss these kind of things and shows like this. Um, and I can't say it any better than you do. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for your work to protect the wild beings of Alaska. And I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Edward Schmidt. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio and the Progressive Radio Network.